God's blessing be on the reading and hearing of both of our scriptures this morning. Shall we pray? O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts find acceptance in your sight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, we continue this morning with our mini look at the book of Revelation. And what a vision today. Can you just imagine what Hollywood would do with the notion that this passage describes real events and then applied their special effects to it. We know it's not really describing a, a, a historical event, but of course Hollywood cares little for that. But can you imagine seeing the old present disappeared into nothingness, the dazzling new floating down, shining in glowing brilliance, a young woman radiant in her wedding garments, just the perfect touch of makeup standing at the threshold of the city. And then a thunderous voice booming through the air. Oh, who would it be? Well, can't be Charlton Heston, but Morgan Freeman, James Earl Jones, who, who, whoever. God now living here on earth with the people. Remember the ancient ancient myths about the, the, the goodly and the godly, you know, heaven is up and the evil earth down here. No more, says the voice. No more tears. No more death. No more mourning. No more crying. No more pain. Who wouldn't want a life like that? The first things have passed away. We're now in a new era, a new age. This is me, says God. This is me the beginning and the end, the alpha, the omega, the A to Z, everything. To the thirsty, those thirsting for life, the real, rich, and, and abundant, full life, I will give it to them. Water as from the spring of the water of life. In other words, the very essence of God's goodness and greatness and power. Oh, what Hollywood could do with this particular passage. We've talked before about uh, among the purposes of, of Revelation was to encourage early Christians to be strong and steadfast. It was not easy in the early days for these new communities. There was oppression, suspicion. Christians were ostracized. They were out of the mainstream, often could not get good jobs, were subject to arrest, and persecution almost on a whim. But Revelation was saying, you just wait. Your reward is coming. And when it comes, it will be glorious, well worth the wait. And in that day, that day, it's kind of a, a ways off, but it's coming. And great will be the reward for those who wait steadfastly. Well, that is wonderful. Wonderful indeed, is it not? What a vision of hope and of promise. The good things that are coming in that day, God is going to set things square. God is going to make them right. Unfairness, the injustices of today, they'll be gone. They will be over. It'll be a new day of life without death, living without pain, loving without losing. It will be here and won't it be a great day. I'm sure it will be. I'm sure it will be. Too often, however, religion, almost any religion, but the Christian faith included, stops here and essentially says, you know, put up with this unfair, this unhappy world because all will be well in the end. Well, that's an easy thing to say for those who are well positioned in life. You know, uh, um, money is not the most important thing in life. Well, okay, and that's especially easy to say when you've got a lot of it. But it's much more difficult when you don't have enough. So it's easy for the wealthy and the well-heeled to say, you know, don't worry about today because tomorrow things are going to be much, much better. That may be the case, but the problem is the here and now. The promise of what's coming 
is all well and good, but we're living in the present. The assurance of food tomorrow is okay, but it doesn't do much good to the person who is hungry today. Visions of justice and fairness in the by and by, that's a worthy encouragement. But there's injustice and unfairness in the here and now. I may have supreme confidence in an ultimate future of wine and roses, but I need something to get me through the present grits and groans of life. And sadly, religion, church, our faith, have often done too little with this contradiction or this, this challenge. Too often we convince ourselves, you know, we ought to just settle for today because everything is going to be made whole someday in some ultimate future. That's why back in the mid-1800s, Karl Marx and some of his fellow rabble-rousers, you know, had the saying, religion is the opium of the people. Because to them, religion was just dulling the senses, deflecting the pain, and made the now matter not so much for the people who were in control. It, it would help, they said, to, uh, for those with to keep at bay those who, who were without. Now, I don't want to get into a big discussion today uh, about uh, Karl Marx and Marxism and whether his indictment of religion or any religion is correct. That's not the point. The point is simply to say th that we know that's not the kind of religion God wants. That is not what God wants. God does not want a religion that accepts inequality and unfairness as writ in stone and immutable for all time. God wants a religion and a faith, however we work that out, to be a religion and a faith that make divine life and love visible. And for us, as Christians, that's exemplified in the life and death of Jesus Christ and affirmed in his resurrection. And that's what the gospel writer John was talking about in the reading we heard from John. As I loved you, you should love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Now, of course, we, we know Jesus well enough to understand that, that God's love doesn't stop at, at the edge of the circle of disciples. That circumference enlarges and grows. The circle of the saved becomes larger and larger, indeed, some will even say it's infinite, and includes all and everyone. We didn't read it today because we do want to get out in time to have dinner, but the, the passage from Acts that was uh, in, our, in the lectionary for today, some of you perhaps have read it. Uh, the uh, Apostle Paul was uh, sleeping, and he had a vision. He described it as like a big sheet coming down from heaven, filled with all the animals, those that were judged to be dirty and those that were judged to be clean. And the voice from heaven says to Paul, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. In other words, look, God made this, all of this. It's all good. It's all good. Okay. So then Paul wakes up uh, from his, his dream, his vision, and he's invited then to the home of some non-Jews, some Gentiles. And he goes in and he's sitting at the table with them, and then it clicks why he had this vision. Because he says, I remember then the word of the Lord. God gave the non-Jews, the Gentiles, the same gift that God gave us. So who was I that I could hinder God? God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. Paul was given a vision of all the world coming together without divisions. That's what God wants. And that's the reality that we are called to be living out week by week, day by day, hour by hour. That's the truth to which we are called to witness so that everyone will know. That is the essence of our Christian walk and journey. 
all well and good, but not always easy and not always fun. Sometimes the Christian service we render is not appreciated. I don't know if it's in the book of Proverbs or not. I guess I, I ought to read the book uh, again and refresh my memory. But more and more I see the truth in that phrase, you know, no good deed goes unpunished. Okay? But we do them anyway. Acts of Christian service may not be easy. They may not be fun. They may not be convenient. And they may not be returned in kind. I had an, any number of examples of that this past week. I could regale you with the stories, but I know you have your own. But particularly when we speak the hard truth against the easy wrong, the Christian witness is not welcomed. At times when we witness to the changes that must be made, how we live together in our community, for example, because there are people without safe places to live, without healthy food to, to eat, and safe water to drink. There are those without access to medicines they need to stay healthy. Well, for that much, just to stay alive. There are places without schools, equipped to provide for just a few years of education now to foster a lifetime of a good life. We'd like to wish that all people, regardless of, you know, gender, race, sexual orientation, color, and all the rest of those divisions, we'd like to wish that they would all be welcomed within the circle of God's care. And sadly, we know that's not the case. It is not always easy to live with love for one another and to show that we are disciples of God in Jesus Christ with one another but we do it anyway, in part because we're supposed to. That's what obedience means, is it not? But we also do it because our experience has shown us that it's life-giving and it's empowering. It says to people, we need not wait till death to experience God. The love of God in Jesus Christ can be had right now, here, today. The invitation and grace by which Jesus lived, these are not abstract principles that somebody just made up and, and wrote down on a piece of parchment. They're principles that are grounded in the realities of the life that Jesus lived out in our midst and then bequeathed to us. And when we acquire them and use them and live them, we are being God present, lifting a lamp, pointing the way, guiding the way, walking the pathway to guide and to hold us up, showing the pathways of the gracious, empowering love that God so earnestly wants each of us to have. Us. Us here in this room, but also the us outside these walls. Souls looking and searching, often not even knowing for sure what they're looking for. But in a life of faithfulness in Christ, we and they will find it for ourselves, for our community, for the world that we serve. And then, then, everyone will know. Everyone will know and turn and find redemption and hope and promise and the life that God wishes for each and every one of us and for all world round. Shall we pray? We do give you thanks, O oh God, for the example of Christ, not only for us, but an example that we in turn can live to show and to be your presence of inviting gracious love to the world we are called to serve. In the name of our Christ, we pray these and all things. Amen.